I V M. Hello and welcome to the Ganatantra podcast. I am Sariyu Natarajan and I am Alok Prasanna Kumar. And in this week's episode, we are joined by Professor Chandan Gowda from Azim Premji University. Uh, Chandan Gowda's research interests include social theory, Indian normative traditions, caste, and Kannada literature and cinema. In addition to his academic publications, he's written for newspapers and published translations of Kannada fiction and non-fiction in English. Before moving to Azim Premji University, he was an associate professor of sociology at the Center for Study of Social Exclusion at the National Law School, Bangalore, between 2008 and 2011. He is presently completing a book on the cultural politics of the development in Old Mysore State. Welcome to the podcast, Chandan. Welcome, Thank you, sir. Welcome, welcome. Hello. So today we just wanted to talk about the state of Karnataka, uh, and those of us, who, those of you who have heard our podcast, would know Bangalore is never far away from our mentions and references in our uh, or our. Uh, Jokes, or our jokes in <laughs> podcast, but we thought we should take a deeper look, in some senses, as to what has shaped the state of Karnataka over the last sixty uh, years of its existence, approximately sixty years of its existence, because it was there as Mysore state immediately after reorganization, and uh, then it has uh, you know it took the shape of Karnataka in nineteen seventy in the nineteen seventies, and uh, now it, it it is in a very different uh, kind of a position. Uh, one of the things which I think I keep getting asked a lot uh, is. Why is it that Karnataka does not, even though you know there was a strong push for a linguistic state, why is it that it has not spawned a culture or a politics of pushing this linguistic agenda forward? Uh, I I usually point to like the Gokak agitation, but beyond that, there has never been like a mass movement of sorts uh, for say linguistic uh, pushing the language forward or the rights of Karnataka's or anything, which we have sort of seen in some senses in Andhra, Telangana, and Tamil Nadu. I just wondered if we could start with some some ideas as to why this has yeah. not happened in Karnataka. Yes, and also, I mean, there have been minor mobilizations, and m- more recently, uh, parties like the one re- led by not a political party in the classic sense, but the one led by Vatal Nagraj uh, and a few others. Um, and I- I'd like to recall our listeners to an earlier version of the podcast that uh, Alok and I had run. In fact, that's how we started yes. our podcasting career, if yeah. you want to call it that, uh, where we looked at some of these issues, and one of the questions was. there is in the electoral alignment in karnataka not just no political party that is mobilizing on the basis of uh, of the kannada identity or the or or anything related to that um, but also that if, funnily enough it is the congress in the last 2018 elections that took up some of these um, questions so in the form of sidramaya writing i think this is something we've talked about in uh, in uh, previous episodes as well ex chief minister sidramaya writing uh, about the finance commission and issues around that uh, though we don't want to go into questions of fiscal federalism um or uh, you know the controversy around the metro as well so to think about you know why is uh, something we'd love to get into um you know the the movement for karnataka's unification as they call it uh, is a late 19th century yeah. story it begins from there yeah. with many people in what used to be bombay presidency marathi speaking areas but also with significant kannada speakers mm-hmm. feeling wronged by the pro marathi atmosphere of the uh bureaucracy and judiciary but what truly is driving the sense that karnataka indeed is a linguistic zone which is scattered across different administrative sort of jurisdictions bombay presidency and the hyderabad karnataka and the madras presidency the mangalore region the bellary region and then old mysore state and coorg which was under the chief commissioner yes. is the histories that were compiled in the mid 19th century a literary history you map the sites of literary production and then you see you see a fit between language activity literary activity and then the natural fit with territory so there was passionate involvement of kannada writers uh, across these scattered territories all through before the state was you know, linguistically reorganized in 1956 but interestingly this need for a kannada territory was never felt uh, was uh, wasn't it was comfortable to locate itself within a broader entity called india hmm. so there's no anti hindi or an anti sanskrit or an anti anything behind it hmm. it was really you know uh, wanted to arrive unto itself and be in an ensconced within this larger space called india so look at the poems that were written they're all kannada mate and bharat mate are going yes. together yes. so once the state is indeed formed it's as if the issue settled 
Right. And the political parties, you know, the Congress mostly, which is leading in most parts of the state for for decades to come, uh, it's not a it's not a matter to push uh, or even profit from. Yeah. And that's the only big party in the state from f- until the early 80s. Yeah. So I think because the Congress is a national party, also <laughs> and also heading the government here, it may not have wanted to push the Canada yeah. uh, um, sort of card too much. But all along, you had a small group of activists, mostly based in Bangalore, who felt, well, Karnataka is a state, Bangalore is a capital, out Canada not to be supreme here in symbolic terms and in, in, in terms of representation in public sort of employment, etc. So you have, you know, a history of a certain kind of mobilization against the new Tamil migrants who have just come after independence who a flush after the Dravida Kalagam kind of uh, language assertiveness that they have seen and that rubs these people the wrong way and if you speak to them they're constantly sharing memories of that uh, you know what they perceive to be a hardened attitude among the new migrants and how they ought to respect Canada ought to you know give it its due etc so this even took the form of a small political party called Kanada Paksha in 1966 mm-hmm which didn't go anywhere but the person who founded it he's the architect of the flag that we have yeah. the Canada the, the two color yeah. yellow um, red flag um, in, you know, to tell you how indifferent the political class was to the Canada cause the Rajyotsava day that's the day in which the Karnataka was formed 1956 yeah. was not an official holiday until the 70s nope. and the, the Canada activists kept saying this mm-hmm. has to become a holiday and these, uh, the ruling uh, dispensation couldn't care less. Just tells you, and this again is part of the continuing sense of uh, exasperation among the activists that somehow we have the Canada cause has been wronged mm. um, by we've been failed and we need a party of our own. But they haven't become a party of their own because it's just a resource question, and I think uh, it's just is there is emotional support they can rely on. But it's not of an electoral kind. I mean, the field is too complex yeah. for it to translate into votes. So you have a running sentiment, I think, which is actually thickening and deepening mm-hmm. over the years, especially after the composition of Bangalore. Its population has changed. There's more Hindi in the air. Tamil is no longer the pet, uh, you know, uh, attack object or an enemy object in the minds of the Kannada activists. It's mm-hmm. it's this. And then this has gone along with, you know, which the central government that has tried to be somewhat more brazen about not caring too much about, you know, about local causes. In fact, on the contrary, the, the Hindi in metro that you alluded to just now, and the realization was there's a metro in Chennai and Kerala, but they don't have a, an obligatory Hindi sign announcement and why must we have it? So there is that. And Sidramaya you know, took up that cause in a very big way. It was all India news. And this has kept, I mean, you know, central government job announcements mm. being done in Hindi only yes. or English and Hindi, yeah. which meant, you know, you have people coming to write the exam in Hubli and the Hubli locals don't know that there's an exam for which they could have appeared. Yeah. And this was when Lalu Prasad was the railway minister and, mm. you know, there was a mobilization against that. Mm. So clearly, there's an on and off, on and off, something happening from outside the state to spark off these sorts of uh, sentiments, a pro Canada sentiments, if you will, and which, you know, in, in the social media space, I think they have enormous support. But, uh, you know, what are the political parties doing? You know, J- Janata Dal is a, calls itself a regional party, but hasn't been clear on the Canada question. Kumar Swami, last year when he was chief minister, sanctioned thousand, a thousand new English medium schools, yes. saying that that's what the people need. If I were him, I would have pushed for a bilingual model where, unlike the current only Canada government school model, mm-hmm. but th- I, I mentioned this not to say he's, he didn't do the right thing, but to say that there's no thinking on the Canada question at all. Mm-hmm. And the BJP, you know, it's again, it's a mixed, you know, the mixed signals. Um, some of the ministers routinely say that Hindi ought to be spoken and learnt while you have another minister who will also say 75% of the jobs in Bangalore mm. out to be reserved for Kanadigas. So there's a way in which the BJP is trying to both sort of say Hindi should be given yeah. a pride of place 
we shall not fly the canada flag so so after the bjp came back to power last year uh, on the occasion of the rajyotsava day they refused to fly the canada flag atop uh, the government buildings uh, mm-hmm. and that must tell you something about how keen they are on because as you know the the true sort of uh, you know a challenge an ideological challenge to to the sort of claims of being a nation mm-hmm. that the bjp the center wants to embrace or has been embracing has been the federal polity question yeah. different cultural regions insisting on having their distinctiveness respected and maintained and not giving into any uh, moves that subordinates them so there is that threat i think which they are actively trying to somehow contain so there, there there is a double speak on this matter so there'll be a minister who will say you know hindi is important for all of us to learn if you want to understand the uh, the importance of modi one must learn hindi i think someone said recently yeah. and you have the uh, education minister who will say we want 70% reservation in local employment for kannada speaking mm-hmm. people for the kannadigas which means 16 yeah. years of residence yeah. here yeah. so it's it's a strange there's no inconsistency yeah there uh, but stepping back we realize uh, canada as a as a policy matter with any coherent sense of um, objectives to attain is missing i mean the the gokak movement that alok referred to which yeah. started in the 80s as a protest against gundurav's attempt at making sanskrit compulsory in government schools right. that was the first big mass movement you have mm. after which you had the sarojini maheshi committee which said english must be i mean canada must be made compulsory in administration and reservation for jobs etc etc none of which was actually pushed for by any government yeah. it's been 37 years now uh, what you have are a series of orders more than 300 government orders saying that should be done that yeah. should be done but yes. no, i think it's done so there is a lack of will if you want to use a cliche mm. uh, behind the cause yeah, yeah there's um, lack of policy coherence as well to your point yeah, yeah. and and i wonder in, in some case senses that we, what we were just discussing is it that there's just too much diversity across karnataka to say this is kannada and this is an issue which affects all kannadigas equally because if we and we spoke about the histories you had uh, the southern part of the state which was mysore princely state you had uh, kur which was under the commissionate you had mysore uh, madras presidency which was uh, Ma- mangalore and uh, bellari you had hyderabad karnataka and you had bombay karnataka and each of them were i think part of that particular political regime i think still even at this moment far longer than they were under a united karnataka for any reason i wonder if that has created a kind of diversity and possible conflict of what works for everyone that has led to something like this you know the fact of you know there being tulu in Mm. in the south kannada region and yeah. kurgi in the kurg region mm. as distinct language units yeah or the fact that darwad karnataka is spoken differently yes. i don't think any of that will explain why okay. we don't have a mm. a pro kannada stance mm. in any political party I, okay. it just hasn't become mm. a grassroots issue mm. or an issue on which a party can hope to win an election right but i think quite um one can with some confidence and fairness in retrospect uh, clearly see a lack of vision on this matter mm-hmm. uh, that what because the literary figures are already sort of complaining about the dominance of english english was the you know after sanskrit was dislodged mm-hmm. you know back in the day yeah uh, we're talking yeah. 700 years um english came to be the enemy yeah Uh, as a language of prestige language with money behind it etc mm. uh, but then there was this uh, you know on, on, in terms of how, the place canada out to have in any school mm. there was just no clarity i mean again to go back to this thing i say i feel there may have been a lot of um, uh, emotional sort of a uh, backing but no one sat down to see what must we do to absolutely secure the transmission of this language across generations now we find ourselves in this deep confusing uh, is one of the reasons it's not found a political articulation or some kind of partisan identity arising out of it um 
is it because unlike in some instances in some ways the tamil movement um as well as in the context of let's say telangana it has another identity attached to it which is in the context of telangana statehood in the context of uh, the movement in tamil nadu caste um and is the inability to link kannada with one of these other identities that could also reside in the individual beyond residence in the state of karnataka uh, could that be one of the reasons that could provide an explanation for the lack of political outcomes based on uh, electoral sort of manifestations of it yeah well, i think uh, thank you i think the f- the absence of another around which one a, a mobilization <laughs> can be built to yeah. ask for a a solid sort of policy things yeah, yeah. that has been missing i mean if yeah. you want to just like english what do you do about it i mean you could like i just feel the political class in the among the set of priorities that mm. preoccupied them mm. as some of policy aims you know land reform caste equality yeah agriculture you know these sorts of things i mean this on the question of culture there has just not been a considered mm. uh, decision and mm. uh, yeah i I think it's one of those I I would like to, I don't have a clear answer if there's a mechanism why we haven't had a strong enough movement mm. but you're right I mean it's not linked with caste here mm. Canada became a cause everyone identified with yeah. across yeah. caste and across religions yeah um so maybe once you start looking I don't have a theory <laughs> but I, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I definitely uh, feel that uh, there has been extreme uh, irresponsibility on the part of uh, Yeah. the policy class yes. on this matter because just look at how the fact that you have 1500 schools in bangalore mm. which have got the license to run kannada medium schools mm. and are actually running english mm. medium schools <laughs> i mean that that tells you something <laughs> about the yeah. like yeah. how much you want to enforce it, it tells yeah. you what how where it stands in your list of uh, priorities yeah. but moving on from language one other thing that we sort of want to discuss and it's always brought up in the context of karnataka politics is the importance of vakkaligas versus the importance of lingayats and the new uh, acronym which has become popular in the last 4 5 years has been the ahinda acronym and for those of our listeners unfamiliar with it it essentially translates into a an as a loose alliance of backward caste dalits and minorities uh, in karnataka um I wonder if we can sort of talk about how this might have played a role that all politics in Karnataka is really just caste politics which leaves no no space for say maybe a cultural or a linguistic politics to emerge. Look, I mean this is you know we we now in the the beginnings of the story are you know uh again late 19th century early 20th century right. uh, the all india level huh. uh mobilizations around caste that you notice mm. by educated people in cities. Yes. and so in karnataka if you look in mysore at that point um the lingayats and vokaliyas start their caste associations in 1905 1906 the kurupas come 20 years after okay but if you look into what who are in this there are no a handful of people the 250 people in bangalore okay they will have a, a small newsletter mm-hmm. but they'll be speaking on behalf of a large collectivity mm-hmm. which may not even know of the existence of this group yes. mm-hmm. So over the years is a gradual uh you know mobilization of support etc but but by then the idea that having numbers on your side matters in representative sort of arenas where voting is a way of uh, accessing power is on people's minds uh so these two castes get there mm. and they are the dominant caste in Mysore and numbers you know locally has about 20% at that time and linga is 11 Mm-hmm. and this statistical uh, size changes after the north karnataka regions get fused with karnataka okay yes. slip to 11 and lingas become 16 yeah. so there the early bids mm-hmm. on making themselves visible and an extraordinary fact that i feel hasn't been investigated and i don't have an answer to this is how the muslims who are almost 12% at that time mm-hmm. were just not part of this imagination of being a legitimate claimant hmm. f- towards being represented in uh, political arenas right you had some discussion of bureaucratic representation but definitely not in the um but be that as it may uh, so you have these big castes who are evenly spread but the fact that they're educated and landed dominance a capacity to you know to put oneself forward as someone who's capable of you know contesting an election etc all of them are gone together yeah and it's only with devrajars 
who is from a backward caste in the mid 70s um who tries to uh, let politicians from smaller castes emerge as yeah. leaders within the congress mm. and he is helped in this task by the fact that he is part of a, a split congress at that time yes. and with indira gandhi behind him uh, he is able to pull off a lot including land reforms right uh, in the middle of the emergency <laughs> something that has to be uh, yeah. looked into closely and after that i think it's been a gradual uh, you know accommodation mm. of the non dominant castes mm. in the political arena the congress of course made allowances for dalits mm. in terms of their there are reserved constituencies and the dalits are solidly with them um, but with the 80s and the janata government you have a shaking up of that yes. uh, janata party makes space for uh, dalits too and they also have lot, significant numbers of dalit politicians mm. so what you have um you know just looking at how the dalit uh, caste uh, politics has shaped um since the 80s uh, there was a sense that there is a division within the dalits yes there are the left handed dalits and who feel like they have not got the advantages political or even mm. reservation advantages in the bureaucracy to the extent that they right have mm. and between them the cultural dynamics are extremely tense yes uh the right is supposed to relate with them the way the non dalits relate with dalits, dalits yes. in every sphere of activity mm. uh so that the janata dal try to uh self consciously cultivate mm. and uh, uh, and accommodate and they were got a had a sense for the adi jambavas mm. as a as a forum for accommodating the left handed among the dalits um and in 2004 you had the ag sadashiva commission which was formed to look into the issue and 8 years later he came up with a report that actually explicitly recommended internal reservation yeah. for the left and the right and what is called the touchable dalits mm-hmm. who you know dalits who are not actually dalits in practice but who had made it into the sc list oh. mm-hmm. okay which is officially recognized mm-hmm. but the that report's recommendation are yet to be implemented it's touchy yeah. but what you do see is that the bjp after the janata dal becoming weak in north karnataka has actually stepped in to accentuate that politics so govind karjol who is the deputy chief minister today yes. is a left uh, right. dalit and the left handed dalits are uh, heavily present in the hyderabad karnataka region mm. where karge also comes from incidentally um so the first time edirappa becomes the chief minister you will notice a lot of attention being given to castes uh, you know the left handed dalit caste uh, grants being made uh, to build various buildings litkar gets an enormous amount of uh, you know, financial assistance the leather workers are there so yeah, so that you notice uh, so the now i think the congress continues to bank on the right handed dalits yeah and um, bjp is now playing with the left that you have that yeah But the backward caste have, you know, Sidramaya's Ahinda movement was really an attractive slogan. Mm. But how much of it has actually happened, even under his tenure within the Congress, is has to be looked into. Um, you know, how many backward caste leaders has he groomed? Yeah, mm. I I can't think of any. Yeah. Uh, you know, definitely the Kurova community has definitely gained mm. uh, in political visibility. um but are there any other smaller castes have gained i'm not sure sure but actually the bjp again it's not just the left hand dalits the smaller castes which needed resources um you know for various you know community objectives during the europe's tenure thing from the budget itself a lot was given out to heads of matas of small castes as development funds mm-hmm. and there was a cultivation of support yeah and you have to look into this uh more carefully i mean if you want to look into the, the most recent phase of backward caste mobilization mm. it's 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 been about the non like in a sense i think somewhat sim- something similar to what has tended to happen in say a place like up where dalit has become synonymous with the jatav caste and backward caste has become synonymous with yadav but that has left out a whole other coalition of castes who 
might belong in the same socio economic status or social and economic status uh, but don't enjoy the same kind of prominence or the same kind of political power that say these two castes might enjoy and I, as you were just saying it i was thinking mentally in my head in karnataka the right handed dalits are with the left left wing parties and the left handed dalits are with the right wing parties <laughs> so it's it's a very uh, i mean and it also also talks about the trajectory of the polity that the congress was able to let in uh, certain categories of uh, or, or certain dalit castes but that still meant that they excluded a large number of uh, dalit castes in the process and it it even within the dalit castes there are clear hierarchies i think what the sadashiva uh, sadashivaya committee says and it's a very contentious con- constitutional issue as it stands today in fact the supreme court is currently due to hear a challenge on whether uh, such kind of inter se uh, um what do you call it uh, preference can be given because i think the model adopted by andhra was not that there will be sub reservations within reservation that you know of the 20 internal inter- there won't be internal reservations but we will give preference to those castes which have not benefited from reservation so put put the way this might work is that say of the 21% of the list of candidates you will first go to the uh eligible candidates from the left handed dalit communities and then go to the right handed community without necessarily saying this many percentage and so on so that's that's a constitutional issue but it also brings forth that when we tend to use the term dalit as a whole we miss out and erase some of the more complicated questions of what this identity means uh, on the ground and we, we can't just use very blanket terms and very blanket understanding of this yeah and now look there's another story hmm. uh, which uh, we can uh, you know the the tribals in karnataka yes i was going to come to yeah it's right. after delimitation yes in 2008 yeah. Yeah. the number of tribal reserved constituencies goes up yeah. from 2 to 15 mm. yeah 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 and and five of them are in bellary alone yeah. yes and uh, shri ramulu and uh, yes satish yeah. jarikuli the jarikuli brothers they're all you know From they're all community. writing on this mm. uh, you know in this newly reserved sort of mm. quotas mm. and that happened because of the constitutional reclassification of tribes in 95 ah. uh, when nayaks mm. you know the, from you know all, they were classified as a tribe mm. for the first time you know you have nayaks uh, you know in chitradurga who always were local to the place and your nayaks from who came from maharashtra mm. they get clubbed mm. and they with their clout are able to uh, you know they, are they seen as tribals by tribals is a question yeah. to ask it's not i mean the tribals you know do they feel more empowered after having 6 15 seats no mm. it's not i mean yeah. it's because it's opened up avenues for an, and here again um, you know the, the bjp was confident because the proximity with the Reddy brothers and Shri Ramulu's own claims to being the leader of the tribals in all these newly reserved. That is a fraught relationship, mm-hmm. but they are with them. Yeah, yeah. and and we we recently had in Bangalore the last few months, some time, a strong movement for increased reservations uh, for the Valmiki community, uh, which is a scheduled tribe uh, community. And interestingly, a lot the of Valmiki this community is the is Shri Ramulu. Ramulu. Yeah, Shri Ramulu. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly this was an agitation which was not led by the politicians but by the spiritual leaders uh, and uh, some of people people may have seen a recent controversial video where edurappa is seen sparring with a spiritual leader who demands a certain number of uh, posts uh, ministry yeah, yeah. posts for uh, members of his caste and i, I, I and i'm wondering is that a subtle dynamic that we are seeing change between the how the political role of spiritual leaders in terms of pushing for the caste's claims You know, the heads of matas have been very important yeah. in politics yeah. not just election politics yeah. in karnataka mm. but what you see happen now the mm. two examples you mention is a certain brazen openness okay. it's no is no longer backdoor maneuvering mm. i mean the the hesitation mm. about being seen doing this is no longer there that's because in the causal arrows go back mm. if uh, yeah europa can openly say mm. if you're a lingayat you have to vote for me <laughs> otherwise you will see one of the leaders <laughs> lose yeah so he, he's made himself vulnerable that way right and the leaders are being you know are, are riding on that mm. confidence that we, we you know, he's he's no one without us yeah yeah and so <laughs> performatively speaking yeah yeah this is behind that confidence mm. and yet europe if you noticed mm. he expressed irritation yes. but he can't quit the stage he, he went back to his seat, seat. Yes. yes um so there is that but more generally Uh, again a phenomenon that has to be studied is the emergence of uh, 
newer matas. Mm. For a caste to be completed, it has to have a mata. mata yes. And historically speaking, it's only the Brahmins and the Lingayats who mm. had matas. Mm. Even the Vakkaligas get their mata fairly recently, 1910. Ah, yes. Although now the histories are, mm. say that it's been an 800 year old mata, which, you know. Um, yeah, so there is this thing where a spiritual head, uh, you have to have one. Uh, someone who can then, uh, you know, be, be a mark of you having been had a composite of, of, of existence that you, you, you that you have. So a lot of Dalit castes have their own mata heads, yes. uh, and you know, they were emerged recently. Mata, to understand, to mean you know, an, an ashram like institution with funds and with the staff and. It remains to be seen the, what kinds of textual traditions they'll you know claim to represent, etc. They'll all be being you know assembled. Yeah. But it's an interesting phenomenon. I wouldn't be cynical about this. I think it's uh, you know it's a need uh, that the communities feel that we also ought to have one, yeah. and I wouldn't uh, you know make them feel guilty. Okay. Historically, you've never had one. How can you have one well, now? Yes. I mean, that's not a, uh, an answer I would uh, give uh, them. But it's uh, fascinating to watch. Yes, so, absolutely. Um, and I wonder if there is a need to, f- is is this an exceptional occurrence as in the case of Karnataka, um, attributable to some of the things we discussed before, the lack of a, of a measurable, definable other, uh, or is it, uh, is it, does it have other social explanations beyond, uh, beyond sort of the trajectories of politics over the last 30, 40 years? I haven't seen anywhere else in the country, the kind of role Matas play in state politics to the extent I have here. Like Yogi Adityan is also part of a Mata. Goraknath Pant that he he represents. But how influential was it? uh, Or, you know, are there Matas like that throughout UP? I don't know. I don't believe so. No, in uh, fact, we asked, uh, I think we we had an episode about Haryana a few weeks ago and we asked the guest, I think Ankur Bharadwaj, Uh, who's a journalist about whether the deras in Haryana are influential. And I think the the synthesis of his answer is that no. Uh, And I think uh, justified exceptionalism for the case of Karnataka in that sense. So, yes. And Matas, I must say, you know, have played an extraordinary role, Uh, you know, outside of being involved in, you know, politics of this kind, in terms of their own community uplift, if you want to use these words, colleges and and, and and settling disputes at the local level, yeah. arranging marriages, ensuring orphan kids are not abandoned, a whole host of things that you would expect to be within the provenance of the state. Yeah. As a, <laughs> but, uh, the, right. the community level, uh, you know, uh, care has been ensured at local levels, and they and sometimes even matas that are identified with the caste have not been exclusive in who they have helped. Mm. So the the legitimacy they enjoy in the region is trans caste. It's beyond caste. That's very interesting, and it's also very uh, aggregation of groups of individuals is also a very interesting way to negotiate and claim state patronage, uh, which, as you pointed out, the Matas have been able to do and are trying to do, um, both by being um, providers of services that are traditionally the domain of the state, but also uh, in the electoral sense, where they're staking claim in more obvious ways uh, and perhaps also through less obvious ways from the back-channel approach. But uh, pulling away from this discussion on caste, which uh, is profoundly fascinating, I feel like we'd, we could go on for a long time, uh, pulling away from that into the another question we've sort of wanted to explore with you, which is the question of Bangalore. Um, I think this, you know, just for a moment, the statistics show that it is about 18, 20% of the state's population, I want to say, yeah, and uh, is about 10% of the seats. Not that this mathematical correlation should have significant meaning or should be the cause for any kind of uh, of uh, reallocation or delimitation, but there's one question there. But also, in some ways, Bangalore has been the site or the imaginary around which some kinds of uh, political movements or political imaginations have been constructed. So, how do we make sense of it? And Bangalore has been in the throes of significant change over the last two, three decades in terms of enormous migration, um, a rapid growth of the city. So, you know, how do we think about it? And in, in, even in, in what way should we, we be framing the questions around Bangalore? See, one response to recognizing the new realities of Bangalore 
which I don't go along with, yeah. has been the demand to say let's give it a separate place, make it a union territory, or have a directly elected mayor with cabinet ministers' powers. Some or say that the tax generated from here, fifty percent of it, should remain within. Hmm. There's a variety of ways in which the the this newfound uh, you know significance for Bangalore is being understood. <coughs> and you're right, twenty eight MLAs are from here, hmm. and this is because. The Bangalore we are referring to is the post two thousand eight yeah. Bangalore. Yes, the, the second were, delimitation when the one hundred and eleven uh, villages were brought in and brought in, and then yeah. that increased the population yes. significantly. Yes, um, but the migration question: more than half of the migrants to the city continue to be from within the state. Mm. Um, so that you know uh, tells you that the number of Kannada speakers is also you know is there, yeah. and from different parts of the state. Um, in you know in terms of there being cultural space for expressiveness amongst various communities i think bangalore has been a free free place it's not you know uh, in fact it's, it's been very hospitable to new things new experiments of various kinds um but i would i would continue to see the story of bangalore as uh, of course it has you know its own energies and its own independence in terms of having its own story to present but in cultural terms i would like to continue to see it as being part of karnataka uh, because the rest of the state is looking at it as our capital city and we can't afford to say well we're separate yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the rest of the state looks at bangalore because uh, you know they have they are the ones who have come here for to meet officers to hear for court cases and and this is the capital city where the legislative discussions are held but also you know they have also felt that you know whenever they they don't have regular power supply they know that you know it's being diverted elsewhere okay. when when in funding is cut for infrastructure that you know you know that is being diverted elsewhere and you know bangalore is everything Uh, although we complain that we don't have as much in terms of road qualities <laughs> or public infrastructure but outside it's seen as a place with everything and i and i think it's important i mean it's evolved in the, in this fashion um my very you know, most villages have family members mm. whose children work here and they mm. go back and it's amazing the urbanization here mm. uh it, it it it's unlike what we saw in the west uh because the people who come here have active ties with uh, their homes and families in the village so festival days you know buses are full impossible so there is a there's a way in which bangalore isn't cutting itself loose hmm. from the rest of the state in yeah. in so many ways yeah. and the entertainment industry is here the news industry is here and where everyone participates hmm. and uh, there's a sense in which bangalore is integral um Yeah, I just feel the the Canada issue is, I think, still a tense matter. Mm. And if you look closely as to what precisely do the Canada activists want the non-Canadians to do, mm. it is not a clear demand. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's really a more of a demand that we, that you know you should not slight the language. It is all sort of symbolic mm. things, mm. and that you should try to learn the language. Mm. And here again. these demands are being made within a federal context where you feel when we come to your state don't we this what activists say when we go there we speak the language and they have to do similarly so a sense of fairness is being imagined here and not an excuse to just assert one's will otherwise it would seem illegitimate it would seem excessive because canadians do have an image of themselves as tolerant and liberal people <laughs> and in fact even the canada activists the more strident kind will tell you show us where we've been violent at yeah. most we may have broken glass and this is what someone told me <laughs> 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 so so there's a way in which i think uh, the local sort of the the canada sort of you know the canada issue uh, those moving into bangalore will have to somehow engage it yeah. Yeah. in some capacity yeah. i don't think there's a strict way or one way of doing it mm. because it is really not a very uh, Uh, I mean, it's 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 it's. I feel this is the one unsettled thing, mm. um, because I, in fact, I don't even think one has to learn Canada mm. at all. I mean, it's just a, it's a it's a, it's a question of gesture. Mm. It's a question of how uh, relating yeah. to a place. I think it's that. Mm. But of course, there are people trying to profit from this anxiety, 
but they haven't grown into an effective political force, yeah. force because their commitment is of that kind yeah. it is an it's a different sort of a commitment you know so yeah i think uh, it's a it's a it's a big question that you've posed i'm not sure if i understood what you um, wanted me to engage but i um, but i think yeah i mean is he speaking more generally i wish uh, bangalore like a whole like the rest of the cities in india became a bit more self confident yeah. <laughs> <laughs> vis a vis uh, culture from outside yeah. i continue to think there's a fascination for uh, f- you know western culture and there's a way, not just in terms of culture but in a way in which um you try to you know take place in relation to the outside world mm. i think in that matter i think a bit more confidence in oneself in what one has achieved and uh that i would like to see yeah. and this is not just about canada yeah. <laughs> this it's, is it's about also about the yeah. city of bangalore <laughs> yeah but w- one <laughs> final question and before we wrap up this episode one gets the sense that there are actually two bangalores um, and well the historical reason is one part of bangalore was under the Ma- mysore uh, principality and the other half was under the Ma- madras presidency and the two were put together and uh, in some ways i think like at least the western parts of the city um have grown into areas which were sort of i think mo- less kannada speaking in some ways whereas the sorry the eastern part of the cities were less kannada speaking in some ways and the western parts were more kannada speaking in some ways i wonder if those boundaries still remain or are getting hardened in some way yeah look the, the cantonment part which huh. you had in mind yes. that was not part of the madras okay. presidency but it was where the british settled yeah the british settled yes and it was an exclusive place and yep. they brought in people to yes. work there mm-hmm. and a high number of urdu speakers right mm-hmm. uh, with a thriving urdu press mm-hmm. uh you know the early i mean that you can sense the difference yeah right i mean uh, even when you go in there yes. uh, the but i think the the previous sense of mm-hmm. you know be it being truly insular mm-hmm. it being an anglo space or uh, is no longer there there's been a lot of movement of people mm-hmm. But I think Bangalore now is. Uh, uh, I mean, if you're truly, you know, this is the broad cut division that you alerted us to. Right? Yeah. The, an Anglo space. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, does it continue to remain distinctive? Yeah. I think that distinctiveness has come down. Okay. Although it hasn't disappeared. Yes. But if you go to different, you know, the the parts of Bangalore headed towards Tamil Nadu will be yeah. different than with Andhra and. The, and <laughs> I, I mean, I think every city has its like sort that. of unique, like micro regions. I suppose I grew up in Hyderabad, which has its, uh, you know, different characters to different parts of the city. Even so, I think uh, that yeah. is the. And I also wonder if it's in some ways related to communities, at least in the in the contemporary sense, can be related to communities seeking the opportunity to be close to similar sorts of people. Yeah. Uh, but one um, quick thing before yeah. I appear a hopeless culturalist, <laughs> and I, I, I do, I, I do think there are serious, you know, yeah. class yeah. Is, issues of class yeah. inequalities in Bangalore. I mean, housing yeah. has, you know, it's just. You I know, have you headed the Bombay way, I f- uh, or have you already reached there? Yeah. Because you know, you have a, a family that has put aside yeah. savings to buy something at the end of yeah. retirement. Yeah. It finds itself unable to do so. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, Yeah I think that's that's very mm. unfortunate I think yeah. housing has become unaffordable yes and uh, and these are the contradictions yeah. you know the the part of the city's wealth has brought yeah. this about yeah. that our real estate has become so expensive yes yeah. yeah I think I hope you know that matter is uh, housing being a being a, an index of mm. a whole set of issues yeah. Yeah. of access to you know water electricity good schooling etc but also uh, a sense of you know living under less hostile conditions mm. uh, absolutely yeah. absolutely and i think i mean i think uh, political mobilization at least in, in my own doctoral work i saw a lot of it was based on the idea of housing or um, in the term in the field it was kayam shashwat like mm. words that indicated that permanence that was yeah. related to the idea of housing uh, and the absolute inequality and there's quite a lot of literature discussing that in the context of bangalore but i think this is all we have time for no, i thank you. Uh, i wish we could discuss this for longer and yes. we definitely would like to have chandan back no oh, thank you sir sometime soon but i think fun talking this, to you yes yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to all our listeners thank you very much for tuning in and see you next wednesday see you Bye-bye. Bye. Sachin Tendulkar, Virat Kohli, Don Bradman and now Cyrus Brocha. Okay, probably not in the right company. 
I mean, Don Badminton is Australian. But it's called Cyrus Says. A wonderful show about everything. Find the show on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Peak Planet, a new podcast where we delve into the fallouts of the growth path that we and indeed much of the world has chosen. Sustainable growth is the buzzword. Until we nail that down, we need to ensure that we keep our population healthy and also have the resources for our increasingly urban lifestyles. I'm Karthik Ganesan, a researcher at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, a Delhi-based policy research institute where for almost a decade we've been trying to explain and change the use, reuse and misuse of our resources. In the first season of Peak Planet, we take up air pollution, public enemy number one and an invisible one at that. Increasingly, the most important risk factor for adverse health outcomes, air pollution has become the most unwanted byproduct for an aggressively growing economy. Over four episodes, we find out how prepared our systems are to deal with this crisis. You can catch the entire first season of Peak Planet out now on the IVM Podcasts app or website or wherever you get your podcast from.